It's five months before the slaughter at Columbine, and the two killers are filmed by a friend in the outfits they will wear on the day of the massacre, long coats and dark glasses. On the left, Eric Harris, 18 years old. On the right, Dylan Klebold, one year younger. Two apparently ordinary teenagers who became monsters. It is here in Denver, a city of three and a half million people in the heart of America, that our investigation begins. We arrive in Littleton, in the southern suburbs. The two killers lived here in this quiet residential part of the city. Dylan Klebold's parents lived here, in a house set back from the street, with a tennis court and private pool. There is a barrier which blocks access. Unsurprisingly, they do not wish to talk to journalists. Dylan Klebold, the shy one with the long hair, was born in 1981. His mother worked with handicapped children and his father was an engineer. They formed a tight-knit family. At junior school, Dylan Klebold was an able student who worked hard. He was even part of a program for precocious pupils. As small children, he and his friend Brooks Brown were inseparable. Well, when I first met Dylan, it was the first day of first grade when uh, everyone kind of picks out their best friend instantly, rather than trying to figure out who you like or who you'll get along with most. It's mostly based on physical. And Dylan and I were both the only tall, gawky, uncoordinated kids. We played Legos all the time when we were kids. Um, so quite often he would come over after school. A typical all-American sort of kid, Dylan Klebold was in the school's baseball team. He played the drums and spent the summer holidays at scout camp. Brooks Brown's parents often invited Dylan to the house and they knew his parents well. They weren't touchy-feely parents like that. It was more clinical, but they cared about their kids. They were there for their kids. Um, you know, they didn't go out drinking. They didn't go out partying. These were parents that were home. Um, they weren't abusive. They, Tom was anti-war, did not believe in guns. They didn't believe in spanking. Dylan Klebold was a youngster much like any other, growing up in an uneventful way in an unremarkable white suburb of a wealthy city. Eric Harris, the second killer, arrived in Littleton at the age of 12. His father, Wayne Harris, was in the army and moved around a lot, depending on his transfers. Eric was a solitary boy who hadn't been able to put down roots anywhere. Randy Brown takes us to see the Harris's house, a short distance from his own home. This is the Harris home with the uh, open garage. <laughs> of course, they don't live there anymore. The fact that they both worked gave Eric free run of the house, and, and they never checked his room and never checked his basement and got away with a lot. Eric entered school in 1993. He became friends with Dylan Klebold. Five years before the massacre, an infernal partnership had already formed. The two friends joined Columbine High School together in 1996, when they were both 15. At the time, Dylan had a friend called Devon Adams. As she approached her 16th birthday, she invited Dylan to her party. When I first met Dylan, he was very shy. You know, he dressed like a, a pretty normal kid, jeans, t-shirts. He, um, he liked computers more than other kids, but besides that, he was fairly normal. He didn't know how to interact with people without another person there or, or something that he could talk about, like a movie or, or music or, or something. Behind the reserved and normal Dylan she was familiar with, Devon would discover a rather darker side. But he was just kind of goofy, had a really um, sneaky sense of humor. And he, he, he was really morose, and he'd make jokes about things that a lot of people don't make jokes about, about death and about um, just really dark things. Dylan Klebold wrote down his sinister notions in a private diary. This journal has recently been made public by the authorities. Hundreds of pages have been scrutinized and scanned by the police. 
In them, Dylan Klebold recounted the pathetic details of his adolescent angst. He drew weapons, coffins, and headless warriors. In a twisted, nervous hand, he expressed his bitterness and revealed suicidal tendencies. He said, My God, I want to die so bad. Not fair. I wanted happiness. I never got it. Let's sum up my life. The most miserable existence in the history of time. Dylan, the whole time I knew him, never had a girlfriend. and never talked about a girl he liked or anything. I mean, I know that there were girls he liked, and you could tell when he talked to them or looked at them, but he never had a girlfriend or anything, and it was never something we talked about. It wasn't something he was comfortable talking about. Dylan Klebold also drew page after page covered in hearts. He was secretly in love with a pupil at Columbine and confided his feelings to his diary. The one who I thought was my true love is not even a shell of what I want the most. She, in reality, doesn't even know me. I have no happiness, no ambitions, no friends, and no love. Devin Adams also hung around with Eric Harris. Eric had a huge crush on me, but I was dating one of his friends, so that wasn't going to happen. Apparently, he blamed me for really taking my boyfriend away from him and Dylan. He blamed me that their, that their group of three friends was suddenly torn asunder by this woman. And um, it's true, I'm the Yoko, Yoko Ono, apparently. To my knowledge, uh, even through the end of the shooting their entire lives, they may have had girlfriends, and I say that very lightly, um, but they never had any steady girlfriends, and they died virgins. Dylan Klebold is seen here, filmed by his friend Eric Harris, clowning around for the camera and mocking country music. Here you are, my good friend Dylan, almost halfway to school. What's up? I'll do your normal morning ritual, waking up. Yeah, uh, it happens, it has to. It is two years before the massacre. The two teenagers record their juvenile exploits on film. <laughs> At this period, they were expressing their aggressive tendencies through banal mockery and cynical pranks. These film documents have never been seen before on British television. Klebold and Harris were both intelligent, and they were both keen computer buffs. Their IT teacher at Columbine, Richard Long, took them on as assistants. They worked with him for an hour or two every day. As students, they were they were very easy for me because it was something. It was a class that they were very excited um, to learn about the new technologies that were coming out, and and it was a, extremely interesting for them so I had no trouble at all yeah I would say they were definitely above average in in my class Eric and Dylan who were perfectly normal but they were bright that's it Dylan was very smart and you could just even tell by talking to him his vocabulary was extensive he was using a lot of high school kids just don't use multi-syllable words Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris were regarded as geeks and as marginal within the school's social framework. They were even called the outcasts. They didn't play any games or sports. They weren't particularly rich. They weren't particularly good looking. 